Hello everyone, good evening. My name is Susan Reyna and I represent Beacon Therapeutic. I am very excited to have Irina Gasner here today from the Ounce of Prevention Fund. For the next 30 minutes, you'll be hearing about some of the great work that's done at the Ounce as well as how the Ounce has been working with Beacon Therapeutic uh, over the past several years on a particular project, but then the broader impact. Just to provide a little background information, Beacon Therapeutic began in 1968 uh, a number of parents wanted to find better educational services for their children and as a result they founded a small school and fast forward to where we are today we are a multi-service provider providing a myriad of services throughout the city of Chicago focusing on special ed special education along with mobile mental health services for homeless women and children I'm gonna put on the overhead some information about the programs that we provide we do have a therapeutic day school we work with children ages K through 12 uh, we have a homeless outreach program where we're providing mobile mental health services throughout the city of Chicago to homeless women and children. We operate an early Head Start program where we're focusing in on children ages zero to three, particularly focusing in on homeless or tenuously housed families. Uh, we have a CHIPRA program that enrolls children, uh, particularly homeless or homeless youth, within Illinois' All Kids Health Insurance Program. We have an innovative project called FACT, Family Assertive Community Treatment, where we're providing specialized services to young mothers with children, and that's how we develop the relationship with the Ounce of Prevention, actually. Uh, we have a little and big intensive outpatient program. It's essentially a day treatment program as an alternative for children who are stepping down uh, from more restrictive settings or are in need of more restrictive settings. Um, our newest program is a 100,000 Homes campaign where we're targeting vulnerable families uh, to move them into permanent housing, and we also operate a traditional outpatient mental health clinic. Uh, Beacon's mission, or excuse me, we have four different locations. We have our administrative offices located in 1912 West 103rd. Our homeless outreach services are based on 117th and Western. Our high school is located in Calumet Park and our elementary campus on Longwood in Beverly houses our elementary school along with our outpatient intensive programs. Our mission is to empower children and families through the provision of, of education, mental health, and social services. Today, I am very happy to have with us uh, Irita Gasner uh, from the Ounce of Prevention Fund. Uh, thank you for joining us today, Irita. Thanks for inviting us. We're um, happy to be here. I, Irita has a master's in social work, and I want to make sure I get this right. You are the senior manager, uh, Illinois Policy, at the Ounce of Prevention Fund. Right. And I understand you have a master's in social work. I do. So tell me a little bit about your background and how you got involved in this work. Sure. Um, as you mentioned, I received my MSW from the Jane Addams College here in, at UIC, here in Chicago. And I actually started working with homeless families with young children um, mm. in an organization here in the city and worked in that in that work for a long time, um, both working in shelter services, but also then working in case management with the families uh, out in the community. Um, and after doing that for some time, I started to develop an interest in actually trying to affect the policy. So mm. it's one thing to help one family, it, it's a great thing to help one family overcome a barrier and meet a goal that they've set. But I uh, also saw how many how many barriers were set up in front of the families. And I thought, you know, maybe I could do work that's actually going to address some of those barriers and could affect hundreds or thousands of families um, as a different way of doing the work. Goodness, now I, I just the light bulb went off in terms <laughs> of why, one, you're so passionate about the work that you do, but also why it's such a wonderful fit with the FACT project. Mm -hmm. So we'll get to that in a second, but tell me a little bit about the Answer Prevention Fund. Sure. So the Ounce of Prevention Fund uh, works to ensure that children in poverty have the best chance for a success in school and life. Um, and we do that in a, in a couple of ways. And we focus on children from birth to age five. Um, and we do that by actually providing um, early childhood services throughout the state for children birth to five. Um, we do this also by operating our Educare School, which is on Chicago's mm -hmm. South Side, mm -hmm. and is a birth to five full day, full year center for children. Um, and is actually a national model. We've uh, There are now 13 edu Educare schools around the country. So that's wow. a, a real innovation from the Ounce of Prevention Fund. Um, and then we do my work, which is advocating for policies that support the healthy development of young children. And we also train early childhood professionals all around the state and the country because we know, particularly with very young children, it's really the adults in their lives who really help make the difference in their in their healthy development. Goodness, so, is it, so clearly you're providing direct services you're doing policy work, but you're also developing national models, it sounds yes. like. So how many, and I'm, the, 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 the program that you have, are there, it, I mean, is it hard to get into the program? How, did, how do you get into that program? 
Um, I mean, it's it's funded by a, a variety of the usual funding streams that mm -hmm. our early childhood programs in the city have. And so it's targeted toward low income children, um, as I said, birth to five. And okay. uh, sometimes it's as parents out there would know, if you have an infant and toddler, it's much harder to get into good services than it is for, for preschool. But mm -hmm. um, I think later we'll give you our contact information. And, and through that, folks can mm -hmm. go to our website or give us a call mm -hmm. and, and learn more if they're hoping to enroll their children. So, uh, you know, describe what is exactly your role. Now, you mentioned you do policy work. What does that mean? Mm -hmm. So I'm actually the main presence for the ounce in Springfield down in our state house with our Illinois General Assembly members. Uh, so basically, it's my job to make sure that those folks that go down and, and deal with funding and enact policies that affect young children understand what high quality early childhood is, why it matters, and also what kinds of services are available for children at home in their districts. Um, so while we're in the legislative session, I am down there talking to lawmakers, testifying before committees, mm -hmm. um, sometimes actually helping move legislation through that process. Um, and in the months of the year that we're not in session in Springfield, we are still out, um, colleagues and myself, um, out around the state because we're going to continue to talk to lawmakers and we actually want to connect them to the early childhood mm -hmm. programs and families uh, that are really being served by the funding that they have a voice in. Um, so we're doing that work. And then we also have a, a, a strong uh, chorus of advocates around the state and we do a lot of training for them um, so that they can really help make their voice heard because that's what's really important to elected officials is what do the constituents, what do the people in my community believe about this issue? You know, one thing, we were talking about this a little bit earlier in terms of, uh, I guess I'm thinking there's so many valuable causes out there. And how do you help push forth the idea of, of children being so important? Mm -hmm. When, yeah, you know, you can talk about folks that are mentally ill, you can talk about veterans. I mean, there's all these challenging sure. uh, causes. How do you help make these children's issues the Sure, the most? absolutely. And we know the families where young children are are affected by a range of issues. So, so it really does all matter. But what we've learned from the last few decades of brain research um, confirms what parents already know, and that's that children are born learning. And what happens for them in the first few months mm -hmm. and years of their life sets the foundation mm -hmm. for all the future learning they're going to do and helps hopefully set them on a path for success in school and in life. So you know, we know research has shown time again that high quality early childhood programs are proven to help children enter kindergarten ready to learn and succeed. We know that children who receive these services are more likely to graduate from high school. We know that mm. children with these services are less likely to need special, uh, special education services, um, remediation programs, child welfare assistance, um, and to actually have higher lifetime earnings. So it's mm. you can make the case that it's an investment in a child, but it's an investment that has payoff for the child and the family and for our entire community. Um, and if I could just add, you know, we, we spend a lot of time trying to figure out how can we address the achievement gap in our schools. Mm -hmm. But we focus so much of the attention on the achievement gap in sort of the later school year time when that achievement gap mm -hmm. is well established and very difficult to change. And it gets, keeps on getting bigger and bigger. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. And we haven't really figured out, there, there are strategies, but it's difficult. But mm -hmm. imagine that if we really focused on those first five years of life, when we actually have the opportunity to lessen do some level of prevention of the achievement gap. Sort of imagine what could happen in the long term in our schools, in our school system, if really every child mm -hmm. was entering school ready to learn because they had the right foundations before they came to school. What are you finding are some of the the best practices within those early learning settings that that you found kind of make a difference? Well, I think. Uh, for the ounce, this is where we really focus on a lot of our training of early childhood practitioners because it is parents, first and foremost, who are their child's first and mm. most important teacher. And so we train professionals who actually go into the home and will work with parents about how to strengthen what they're mm. doing in the home um, to really make the most of those early years. And then training the educators. Um, young children mm. need a consistent relationship with a caregiver that they're attached to. And that can mm. include parents, but also anyone who might be caring for them outside of, of the home. And so I think we really focus, I mean, there are, there are a lot of quality elements that are very, very important, but I know the ounce is particularly concerned about making sure that 
that we have professionals working with these children who are really trained to make the most of those years. Yeah, I'm going to put some pictures up of some of the kids that we're talking about because I think that it was kind of makes it more exciting. Um, also, reminding everyone, this is a, a live call-in show. So if you have any questions or comments, uh, the number is located on the bottom of your screen. So please uh, give us a call. And, you know, you mentioned uh, in terms of approaches, and I know this is a good segue perhaps into fact mm -hmm. and what we've been doing with the Family Assertive Community Treatment Team. You've been involved in the planning coalition, and it's right in line with um, what you were saying in terms of making not only, um, you know, working with the families, but then also making a system impact. So mm -hmm. the FACT uh, project, Family Assertive Community Treatment Team, essentially beacon, modify the assertive community treatment model for families, and as a result, develop this model that, that we feel is both evidence-based and a promising pr as a promising practice uh, in terms of working with young mothers and uh, ages 18 to 25 who have one child under the age of five. <clears throat> and if I can just do a quick plug, uh, we just had a national evaluation through ABT, and they found it was a SAMHSA-funded uh, evaluation, and as such, they found that uh, the FAC project, along with 15 other national projects, uh, had a con contained essential elements that really make it a uh, promising or emerging practice, mm -hmm. which we felt very proud of and we felt very good about. But you've been involved in the planning coalition aspect of it because the project not only looked at mother well-being, child well-being, and family, but it also really looked at system well-being. So tell me a little bit about what your role has been on the planning coalition and what you've been doing within that um, within that arena. Sure. Um, a number of a number of us from the early childhood advocacy organizations were invited to be at the table. Um, because we need to make sure, as I mentioned, families have a range of needs. And even though we sort of may work in our sort of homeless system or our early childhood system, that's not the reality of, of families' lives. So um, as someone who had worked with homeless families and early childhood in the past, uh, it was extremely gratifying to note there was a project going on that was really designed to sort of better bridge these two systems. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes when homeless are, families are homeless, the main concern is housing the family and sometimes other needs of the family can can sort of wait well the problem is if a child is two or three years old you can't wait you can't lose that mm. time you have with the family and the impact of being homeless can be very detrimental um, to the to the developmental to the development of the child um, so again I was really excited to be asked to participate because I've been wanting to kind of get back to the work with homeless families and really bridge it with the work we're doing um, at the ounce so I think, you know, we really have through that work and through the meetings and the people we've brought together to talk, we've started to really bridge the two worlds and to think about how what early childhood can sort mm -hmm. of bring to homeless providers. And so um, and then vice versa, what what the homeless providers can bring in terms mm -hmm. of uh, our, our work with families. And um, I know that there have been some really interesting ideas and I, that have already moved forward. And I hope we can keep growing on those like um, joint training where shelter providers mm -hmm. and early childhood providers came together and really learned about what each other were doing. And I'm sure found that they were serving some of the same families yeah. in the community. Mm -hmm. And so to really build better relationships in the community so that folks know who to talk when they're trying to help families solve problems. Um, because of the work of the FACT project, um, we now have a lot more conversation about homeless children at some of the early childhood planning bodies like the Illinois Early Learning Council, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and that's very important. So we are now sort of thinking more about homeless children as we move forward some of our early learning um, po policies and priorities. Um, and then uh, Another idea that's sort of come to fruition is really working jointly between shelter providers and the early intervention system, which works to identify and then provide services for infants and toddlers with developmental delays. Um, because obviously, as we've mentioned, the earlier you start, the better. If children mm -hmm. are starting to show delays at a very young age, often you can get those cleared mm -hmm. up and the child can get right back on track. And so, it, you know, if, if the shelter system and EI are not talking, early intervention, excuse me, are not talking to each other, those children could language for, languish for three and four and five years before they can mm -hmm. uh, get some help for those those problems. Mm -hmm. So it's very exciting. Yeah, and actually we can go back to that because I think there's some really neat, simple examples mm -hmm. that, that really make a difference. But I understand we have a caller. Uh, yes, there's a question. Yes, hi. I'm wondering if you are aware of someone. Oh. Oh, just okay. lost that one. Okay. Um, you know, in terms of um, one of the things that I think we found so unique in doing this work is that there's so many systems out there that are supposed to target uh, low poverty families mm -hmm. or homeless families in particular, but there was no mechanism for that to happen. And I think that's what was so 
uh, one of the best things about this initiative is that we're able to identify within home, you know, the home, uh, the Head Start program, early intervention. They're supposed to target these vulnerable families, right. but there was no system to do that. And how much more vulnerable can you be if you're already homeless and right. you have a child? And we know the impact of homelessness on children, and we know the impact of trauma and on brain development. You mentioned it earlier. Mm -hmm. So clearly, this population is the one that should be targeted. Exactly. Okay. I think they're, they're not always the families who are showing somewhere and requesting the help. So we really exactly. have to do the outreach to, to identify them. And there's been some neat uh, collaborations, and we'll get to that. Uh, apparently, there's a caller. Are the callers back? Yes. Hi. I, um, I'm just wondering, like, as an early childhood educator or as a person in the community that you become aware of someone who is experiencing the trauma of homelessness mm -hmm. and their children need assistance, how do they go about getting the assistance? Could you give some information in terms of how to get a hold of people at Deacon Therapeutic and what the process would be? Sure. Let me put that contact information on the screen. Um, a couple of things. In terms of, you know, you can contact us at that 773-233-3821 or at our administrative offices at 773-298-1243. Of course, the website is always great, www.beacon-therapeutic.org. In terms of the services um, that we provide, um, oops, I think, oh, in terms of the services <laughs> we provide, um, we clearly uh, can do a myriad of things. I mentioned that we offer early Head Start services, and we are targeting folks that are homeless or at risk of homelessness so they can, you can access our home-based services. So the home visitors will go into the home and provide all the necessary services that are that are part of Head Start and are based on a service plan and what the needs of the family are. And then also we're going into the shelter. So that, you know, that contact information I, I just put up. Also, if, if it's not something that we can provide, we are very savvy at identifying um, resources and so and I can put information on for the ounce of prevention as well. And I, you know, one thing I'm wondering, um, Arita, can you, how, how can people help with the ounce of prevention as well and the work that you do? Sure. Um, and you see our phone number and our, our email, or excuse me, our website address up there as well. It, it, the really important part of the work we do is actually getting folks who care about early childhood to take action and to let our elected officials know that they care about early childhood. If we don't have the funding to serve children, we can't serve children. Um, so at our at our website, you can sign up to receive action alerts at different points during the legislative session to email lawmakers and to make your voice heard that way. Um, and you can just visit our website. There's a, a lot of resources on our, our website I think people would find interesting. And we're obviously also on Facebook and, and Twitter. Um, and actually, we have a really kind of fun project we're in the middle of right now where we are um, working. Right, I'll put that on here. There okay. We are a part of a, a national grant competition to develop um, an app. And we want to make an app to erase the achievement gap. So that's what mm -hmm. we're hoping for. But we need folks to vote for us so that we have a chance to win this competition and then create um, a mobile app that, for example, I could be using in Springfield to show lawmakers, here's the amount of need there is in your community. Um, and so, and I think that's just the starting point. Uh, you know, we can explore this technology, but first we have to be able to win this contest. So um, people can visit our website to vote for us there as well. Yeah, and I understand you can vote once from each of your devices or something, but you can vote multiple times, I suppose, if you have multiple devices. Right. And it and, ends July 2nd, so. And I think the nice part, doesn't cost anything, doesn't do anything, and it's it's something that's free, That and I know there's be been helpful. some other things that like that that I I'm intrigued by all this concept of voting on the internet, which is Absolutely. interesting. Um, so this is really challenging work that you're doing. What do you find rewarding about it? Well, I think I decided a long time ago when I went to social work school that... Um, I'm a social worker, too. So. <laughs> when, uh, when I go to work, I need to feel like I'm doing something that sort of makes a difference. And I, I do feel like this work makes a difference. And as you've mentioned, I have a, a passion for it and interest for it. And I really, I hope that when I'm speaking to a lawmaker, they can tell that this is something mm -hmm. I'm coming to Springfield to talk about this, not just because it's a job, but it, because it's something that I think really matters for kids and for our entire country. And um, so that's the most important thing is just knowing that you're trying to contribute to, to making things a little bit better for kids and families who might be struggling. And I think, you know, the long-term impact that you're describing, that if you really look at it long-term, and I suppose that's a selling point for legislators too, is having them see if you make this investment now, right. you're making a big impact. Right, and you can impact some of the other sort of issues that we're concerned about, crime, mental health. You mm -hmm. know, it, it doesn't erase those kinds of problems, but it, the more children we can invest in with healthy development up front, 
um, the less need we're going to have for some of those more intensive and, and, you know, frankly, more troubling kinds of interventions later on. Absolutely. You know, one of the things that you're mentioning, those other, the other systems that are impacted, and I know one of the things, and you touched on it before the call, in terms of some of the more, uh, the deeper impact that's being made in the work that's being done, particularly around fact, if we bring it back to fact, mm -hmm. in terms of, of being able to develop um, on piloting neat projects that are making a difference. Can you talk a little bit about some of the pilot projects that have been going on? within fact? Yeah, I think the, the one that I mentioned was around um, the early intervention program and shelters. So, um, you know, folks are trained folks from early intervention are working with shelter staff to help them work with parents to do a questionnaire that gets at how the child is developing and if there are any concerns there. Um, and that if there are concerns that Screening can be a basis to actually refer a child for more evaluation mm -hmm. and get some services if that's what we need. Um, but I think it's an exciting idea because it's having shelter staff start thinking about how children develop and how shelter life could affect mm -hmm. that. And I think that was something that maybe wasn't as prevalent before. Mm -hmm. So I am hopeful and it. Yeah, I think the desire is we can get some things that are working well in a pilot fashion and then um, talk to people around the city and around the state to really see it happen in more mm -hmm. places. And I think it coincides um, on, on, the, on the city level, uh, just actually today, the plan 2.0, the next plan to end homelessness was approved by the planning council and the mayor will be releasing the plan, you know, in July sometime. Uh, I think what's exciting about that plan, though, is that there's clearly an identification of meeting the development, developmental needs of children. I know you were a very strong voice in making yeah. sure that happened. <laughs> uh, also, we have a homeless families constituency group that really was pushing forth mm -hmm. those agenda items to make sure that when uh, shelters are looking at their myriad of services, that they're really identifying what are the needs of the children, what can we do, you know, acknowledging that there is uh, you know, developmental impact when a child is homeless and what can they do. And I think that's what's exciting because I think overall the system continues to evolve to identify the needs of mm -hmm. children and the needs of families being important and why that's so important and really looking at the long-term impact. I agree. It can be overwhelming when you work with a family. There's usually a lot of issues and, mm -hmm. um, I, you know, it was my experience in the past in my former work that very often the needs of the kids had to wait mm -hmm. till some things got resolved. And I think what I learned over my experience was we've got to be working on it all, um, which mm -hmm. at the same time, and which is why it's so important for organizations to work together, um, mm -hmm. because no one provider or case manager can sort of handle everything that comes out of that situation. But if we're really um, working together with organizations from very varied, varied backgrounds and varied, varied strengths, we can really get more done with the families to really address their needs in a way that makes sense. Well, and I think, you know, you're, you're talking of two things. One, it's the need for collaborations, and, you mm -hmm. know, and that's where people leverage different mm -hmm. resources, whether it's funding or whether it's skill, right. uh, you know, or, yeah, it's, it's the same folks you're talking about. Mm -hmm. But I think it's also evaluating the effectiveness of it, and I know you, you were able to cite quite eloquently what is the impact of this work on the children long term, and I think that's the other piece that uh, sharing these resources, but then also evaluating the effectiveness is so important, absolutely. and it sounds like that's what's being done. Yeah, absolutely, and it's we've been moving in that direction and now we are in you know tough fiscal times with mm -hmm. public dollars and so um, in Springfield we've been moving toward a, a, an approach called budgeting for results and so yes, if I, if I, go, <laughs> if I go talk about um, mm -hmm. funding that I need I need to be prepared to say here's why it matters mm -hmm. here's our here's our data um, and so that's the work everybody's doing but it, we're fortunate in early childhood there's there's strong data and growing bodies of data uh, you know of information that's really going to be helpful to us yeah and I think the uh, you know this whole, uh, the whole the need for evidence-based work and so on I mean I think overall whether it's the mental health or it's early mm -hmm. childhood everybody's really committed yes. to that because yeah resources are scarce right. and how can you show that what you're doing is effective in the long term right. so that makes so we have about a, a minute left Left. Any final comments, Arita, from you before I put some uh, some final <laughs> sure, slides, slides up? up? I just want to thank you again for the opportunity to talk some more about the work we've been doing together and the work that the OUNCE is doing. Um, you know, I think the OUNCE Prevention Fund is a, an essential voice for children in Illinois, and we need um, a lot of other voices along with us in these tough times, um, both in our state and across the country, and we really need to let 
lawmakers know how decisions are being made and how they're affecting children in our community. So we really um, hope you'll visit our website, sign up for our alerts, vote for us in the mobile app application. We would love to add your voices to, to the work that we're doing and uh, appreciate the partnership we have with, with Beacon and look forward to moving, uh, moving the work forward together. Well, thank you. We can't do our work alone, so we need folks like you because you are a powerful voice, so that's wonderful. I'm going to put some information up about uh, a fundraiser that's coming up for Beacon. It's our Beacon Bash. And actually, it funds uh, our uh, our homeless program in particular, and this really is working with children and families. So it's July 26th, Thursday. It's at Joe's Sports Bar on Weed Street. Uh, for tickets and information, you can contact Peggy Rourke at 773-298-6441. And since this is our last show, we, of course, want to acknowledge and give a special shout-out to our friends at Can TV who put up with us every week. Uh, so Barbara, Tiffany, Steve, Sylvia, Amari, and Mike, thank you very much. Uh, it's been a great season. And Irina, thank you so much for joining us. It really thank is you. a pleasure working with you and your Same organization. Here. It's great work. Um, thank you very much.